Land Rover, the legendary, rugged, go-anywhere vehicle. Whether powering over a rocky trail, through the bush of Kenya, or the mud of Madagascar, you knew it would pull you through. But the Land Rover's engineers were not satisfied. In the 1960s, if you wanted a vehicle that could do this, but also this, or this, and most of all this, you didn't have many choices. We've been watching decades of TV ads showing exactly these types of shenanigans, so now we all genuinely believe our active lifestyle demands a sport utility vehicle. But back then, this was all properly novel stuff. Before that, a utility vehicle was just that, a device that a farmer owned to help get work done. The Range Rover broke new ground, nothing before it had ever combined such broad capabilities, and it did this with levels of panache, innovation, and most importantly, authenticity that have made it one of the most iconic vehicles ever made. The Range Rover descended from a fantastic but accidental success that the Rover Car Company created out of desperation. In 1948, they created the Land Rover as a stopgap product to be built for two or three years until Rover Car manufacture could resume at scale. But by 1951, Land Rovers were outselling Rover Cars two to one, and production ended not after two or three years, or even two or three decades, but after 67 years in 2016. When the war ended, Rover were anxious to get their factories back to work, a common sentiment all over the economically battered United Kingdom. Central to this was a policy known as export or die, in which the British government incentivized industry to generate much needed foreign cash by selling British goods overseas. Scarce resources like steel were only allocated to firms with a proven track record of selling their products outside of Britain. So Rover's management decided to hastily design a rugged and affordable utility vehicle specifically for export. What became the Land Rover was heavily influenced by a military surplus Willis Jeep owned by Rover's chief engineer, Spencer Wilkes. On his farm in Anglesey, he used the Jeep for all manner of missions and realized that something similar would be the perfect device to help people rebuild after the war, keep Rover's factory and workforce busy, export in order to secure allocations of steel, and generate much needed cash to fund Rover's first post-war car design, the P4. The Land Rover was quickly but thoughtfully designed, with the first prototype being ready in just five months. It wasn't just a Jeep copy, though. Critically, its body was made not of steel, but of aluminum, which was plentiful and cheap. Additionally, it had doors and a roof, true luxury. It also had an extremely strong box section chassis, four-wheel drive with high and low ranges, a locking differential, a handbrake that operated on the transmission so that it acted on all four wheels, waterproof wiring, all-weather finishes inside and out, and a power takeoff so various farm and work implements could be driven off the vehicle. The Land Rover entered production in 1948 and was an overnight success, becoming much more than just the farmer's best friend as originally envisioned. Although it had 52 horsepower and rode like a tractor, it was durable, useful, and nearly unstoppable off-road. They were exported in massive numbers around the world. Legend has it that at one point, for a full third of the world's population, the first motor vehicle they ever saw was a Land Rover. In Singapore, they get the welcome they deserve as the first motorist to have driven across this great overland route. These sturdy Oxford and Cambridge vehicles were examined by the Rover organization on their return, and it was found not a bit the worse for this toughest of endurance tests. 18,000 miles, London to Singapore. Almost immediately, work began on making a more civilized Land Rover with a series of about two dozen prototypes called Road Rovers built between 1951 and 1959. Their purpose was not to provide a luxury Land Rover, but to provide a more roadable, civilized vehicle that would be at home on Britain's and the world's growing motorway networks. But Rover always saw itself as a car company. Although they invented the modern bicycle in 1885 and began making motorcycles in the 1890s, they had been making cars since 1904. During the 1930s, Rover built a reputation for making respectable, innovative, high-quality cars. In the 1950s, they still saw the newly introduced Land Rover success as a tool to help them with their main business of making cars. The Road Rover project was finally cancelled after eight years, but two changes occurred in the 1960s that brought the idea back around. Both of these changes were motivated by Rover's market studies in the United States, 
One conclusion was that there was a growing market for four-wheel drive leisure vehicles, stuff like the International Scout, Jeep Wagoneer, and Ford Bronco. The second was that Rover's cars needed more powerful engines to sell decently in America. At the time, Rover's most powerful engine was a cast iron 3-liter inline 6. And before spending big money to develop a new engine, they looked around to see if an existing American V8 could fit the bill. As luck would have it, the head of Rover's American operation, Bruce McWilliams, happened upon a Buick Skylark engine while visiting Mercury Marine regarding their collaboration on marine applications for both Rover gas turbines and diesel engines. The engine he found was a recently discontinued 3.5 liter V8 which had been used by Buick, Oldsmobile, and Pontiac between 1960 and 1963. It was surprisingly innovative with all aluminum construction which made it the lightest mass-produced V8 in the world and gave an excellent power-to-weight ratio. A quick set of measurements confirmed that the engine would fit in every existing Rover product. Rover obtained an agreement for the engine with General Motors in 1965 and set about developing it further to improve its reliability and performance. The Rover V8 would become one of the greatest engines of all time and demand for it was huge. It would also be perfect for the new, more civilized four-wheel drive vehicle that was just taking shape on the drawing board, which was, for the moment, called the 100-inch station wagon for the length of its wheelbase, but would eventually be called the Range Rover. The mission was simple, combine the off-road capability of a Land Rover with the comfort, on-road performance, handling, and refinement of a Rover car. Key to improved comfort was the long travel coil spring suspension instead of leaf springs, which offered sensational axle articulation for off-road use and a quantum leap forward in compliance over Land Rover. The Range Rover was full of other clever touches too, including power disc brakes all round with redundant dual hydraulic lines to the front calipers, aluminum outer body panels, and of course the dual range permanent four-wheel drive system with locking center differential. The first prototype was built in the summer of 1967 and was remarkably close to the final product. It was developed quickly, with program approval coming in January of 1968, and the first production vehicles being completed a little over two years later in the spring of 1970. The rush schedule was most obvious inside the Range Rover, where it was comfortable but more spartan than originally intended, with plastic floor coverings, somewhat austere seat upholstery, and a surprising amount of painted metal visible. But the core engineering was spot on, and it was on a completely different planet from a Land Rover. Consequently, the Range Rover was an immediate sensation when it arrived. Demand was huge, with waiting lists stretching beyond one year and second-hand examples trading for more than new ones, even five years after production started. At a shade under 2,000 pounds with tax, about $50,000 in today's money, it was costly, but it was effectively without peer. It could cruise at more than 90 miles an hour, but could go anywhere off-road that a Land Rover could, and on top of all that, it was genuinely stylish. It won technical awards, design awards, and was even displayed in the Louvre in 1971. It also proved its worth in extreme circumstances. They were rallied, and in fact, a Range Rover became the first four-wheel drive vehicle to ever compete in the World Rally Championship in 1979. It achieved 15th in the Safari Rally in 1980, and won Paris-Dakar in 1979 and 1981. One of the Range Rover's most remarkable achievements was the 18,000-mile British Trans-Americas expedition of two Range Rovers on the Pan-American Highway beginning in Alaska in December of 1971 and finishing in Ushuaia in Tierra del Fuego more than six months later. This required crossing the Darien Gap, a 250-mile section of jungle and swamp that has been crossed by four-wheeled vehicles only seven times. In this case, it took 99 days to cross and required the support of Britain's Ministry of Defense, 64 people, 28 horses, one de Havilland beaver, and the United States Panamanian and Colombian Air Forces. The numbers are truly impressive. 10 tons of rations, 15,000 gallons of fuel, 2,400 cans of beer, 80,000 cigarettes, and many broken differentials. So many that Land Rover had to air freight more from England, which delayed the expedition a full 25 days. River crossings were achieved by special rafts engineered by the Avon Tire Company, or sometimes simply by driving through them. At one point or another, 30 of the 64 people on the expedition had to be evacuated for medical reasons. The Range Rover received basically no updates for the first decade of its life, aside from the addition of a rear wiper and optional power steering in 1973. Other updates would not arrive until after 1978, when Land Rover was spun off of British Leyland as a semi-independent entity. 
Once that happened, new futures arrived one by one over the following years, together with major investments in the factory to expand production. Freed from Leyland, the Range Rover could finally grow in response to a decade of feedback from customers who wanted the Range Rover to further embrace its image as a go-anywhere vehicle with an adventurous spirit that didn't ask its occupants to give up comfort and features the way that a Land Rover did. This accelerated through the 80s as the Range Rover pushed further up market. In 1981, the first factory-produced four-door appeared, as did the iconic three-spoke alloy wheels. Also in 1981, the first Vogue edition Range Rover appeared, which had a nicer interior and other special trim. The four-door Range Rover rapidly became the default body style, accounting for 75% of sales just two years after it was introduced. Features continued to pile on. Mechanical updates arrived too, with the introduction of an automatic transmission and a fifth ratio being added to the manual transmissions, together with a new transfer box, which was much quieter than the original. This change in particular helped the Range Rover develop into a credible alternative to conventional luxury cars during the 80s. All through the decade, more improvements came fast to further this goal. Electric windows, electric heated mirrors, headlight washers, optional leather upholstery for the first time, together with a cosmetic freshening and electronic fuel injection. 17 years after a desire to increase US sales helped create the Range Rover, it finally became available there. Land Rover entered the market carefully, aware that it was a very competitive space and that the name was unknown, but they did such a good job that Harvard Business School later made a case study about it. Sales exceeded projections the very first year and continued to grow, with North America becoming Range Rover's largest export market. The feature list continued to grow too, strongly motivated by demanding American consumers. Electric seats, cruise control, electric sunroof, four-channel ABS, a larger 3.9-liter engine, and by the 90s, a computerized air suspension system, traction control, and dual airbags, all three of which were firsts in a sport utility vehicle. For 1993, despite the design being well over two decades old, a long wheelbase Range Rover was introduced, powered by a stroked 4.3 liter engine marketed as a 4.2, which provided limousine-like rear legroom in the fastest factory-built Range Rover up to that point. After 26 years, production of the original Range Rover finally ended in February of 1996. The Range Rover and its numerous sub-variants are very much alive and well today. It is still the original, still the standard by which luxury SUVs are judged. Things have come a long way since then, and that's abundantly clear when operating a Range Rover Classic. It is dimensionally small compared to modern SUVs. A Toyota Highlander is six inches wider and a foot longer. The visibility is fantastic with a high driving position, low belt line, tiny pillars, and even helpful crenellations at the corners of the hood so you can see exactly where they are. You'll feel regal and imperious, the master of your doubtless expansive estate. Yes, it's good to own land. Underway, the Range Rover is from another era. With live axles and a separate frame, this is much more truckish than most trucks. Even today's holdover separate frame SUVs like the 4Runner feel more agile. In no sense whatsoever is it sporting, although taken in the context of how 70s family cars drive, the ability of the Range Rover to do almost any on-road task at least as well as the typical high-end sedan of the era is remarkable. In their first test in 1970, Autosport magazine explained that the Range Rover combines excellent road behavior with an almost miraculous performance where no roads exist. It is certainly great fun to drive under both these conditions. Part of the fun is figuring out what inputs to provide in order to get the desired outcome. Any change in speed or direction must be deliberate, making it something of a momentum car, and this makes it surprisingly engaging. The torque gives an inexorability to how it gains speed, even if the sensation of acceleration is more auditory than physical, while gear changes from the 4-speed ZF automatic have a firm high-quality feel. Cornering feels initially alarming, but further investigation confirms that it's actually a lot more capable than you initially assumed. And if you're particularly perverse, giggle-inducing hustling is possible, if inadvisable. Despite the ponderous first impressions, the Range Rover is immensely charming. It's easy to operate, genuinely comfortable, and has a fantastic atmosphere, but it's not at all detached. In fact, everything it does has texture, and you'll never find yourself going faster than you think you are. 
It feels special and is an experience in the way that the best old cars are. It is unashamedly mechanical, but not in a fatiguing or unpleasant way. It is, in a word, honest. And that's the soul of the Range Rover Classic right there. It's incredibly authentic. It is very much of a time and place. It couldn't have come from any other country, and certainly nothing like this would be made today. Its identity is so strong, its personality so unique, that it feels like more than just a machine. Land Rover initially marketed it as the car for all reasons. Four cars in one, a luxury car, a performance car, a station wagon, and an off-roader. For decades, no other vehicle could touch the way a Range Rover combined these characteristics, but today there are many other vehicles that approach or maybe even equal it. In usefulness and competence, maybe, but very few of them can touch the Range Rover for its combination of experience, style, and desirability. <laughs>